Okay. All right. Let's go. So uh, we've been working our way through the digestive system. Uh, we're down to the small intestine, which is longer than the large intestine. So why call it the small intestine? Because it has a smaller diameter. All right, significantly smaller diameter. We divide it into three com three portions. All right, which are by no means of equal size. The first is the duodenum, and uh, if you look at uh, if we go back to the stomach here, all right, the duodenum, the duodenum begins here at the pyloric sphincter, all right, and does a does a hairpin turn, all right, um, essentially framing the pancreas as you're going to see, and uh, and it's it's only a little short thing about the width of. Twelve fingers, which is what duodenum means. You know where I learned that? In your textbook. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh huh. Okay. So yes, that is. All right. So, um, so we get we get into the duodenum and think about what's going on as uh, as. The pyloric sphincter is, in a timely manner, allowing the acid chyme from the stomach to be delivered into the small intestine. Um, we see the bone is only a millimeter or two millimeters diameter. So something, how do you see corn passing through it? Do you want to try it again? We really were wondering. Uh, let's not. Let's not. Let, uh, no, I, I, it can open more than that. It can open more than that, Edie. But you know, if we're talking about a liquefied material, all right, it's just liquid is squirting through. So it's about controlling the volume, right? But if you have things that have not been digested, like big cellulose, things like corn, the outer sh outer um, uh, seed coat, if that's what it's called, the seed coat of corn, then obviously the sphincter has to open a little bit more. Okay. All right. So. Uh, the things you guys worry about. Um, so, you have acid chyme, pH 2, all right, coming into the small intestine here at the duodenum. The enzymes that are being generated by the pancreas function at pH 8, all right? And so, if those enzymes coming from pancreas that are going to complete the rest of digestion or most of the rest of digestion are going to be effective, we've got to neutralize the acid. And that's what the Brunner's glands are for, all right? You see the, the, the name here. The Brunner's glands are glands in the submucosa. They are huge. Some of you may have looked at them uh, when you were... Did anybody look at cross-section of, of uh, duodenum in lab? All right. If you ever get a chance, or just go online, go to the... You know, just Google it, you know, and you'll get a histology slide and uh, take a look at it. They are, they are very impressive uh, glands. In addition, what else are we going to find in the duodenum? You're going to find the um, duodenal papilla, which is where the pancreas and gallbladder drain their contents into the pancreas, all right, or into the, uh, into the duodenum. And when we think about our four layers, what do we got on the outer side? What's the outermost layer for the duodenum? It is a fibrosa. It's a fibrosa, not a serosa. All right, it's a fibrosa, and it actually sits retroperitoneal. All right, it sits retroperitoneal, so it's um, sitting back. All right, behind the, the peritoneal membrane. Okay, all right, behind the peritoneum. Next segment, the jejunum, and the jejunum takes up two fifths of essentially that six meter distance. All right, if we just ignore the first twelve fingers. All right. Um, if we ignore the duodenum, two fifths is jejunum, and we're going to see in the jejunum um, the, all the characteristic features of most of the small intestine. That is, we're going to see the four layers with a serosa down the whole length of the thing. All right, we're going to see circular folds and villi and microvilli. So the the, the Jejunum is fully equipped, and frankly, this is where you're going to see most of the, well, I'm going to even go all the way and say almost all digestion and all absorption with very little bit left, all right, at the end 
uh, for the ileum or even some somewhat a tiny bit for the, for the large intestine. But for all intents and purposes, we can say that digestion, that is chemical digestion, right, is being completed in the jejunum and absorption is occurring almost to completion there as well, all right? The jejunum is uh, intraperitoneal, all right? So we're going to see it completely invested in a serous membrane, all right? In the, it'll, it'll have its, its visceral, uh, its, um, its um, visceral peritoneum, right? Its serosal layer, its visceral peritoneum, same thing, all right? And then finally, the, the uh, third component, making up three-fifths, all right, of the, of the six meters is the ileum, all right, and this is the, the, the trailing end then of the small intestine. It likewise is intraperitoneal, therefore the serosa is, a, is the visceral peritoneum again, all right, um, and both of these will uh, be secured in place by that mesentery, all right, and I want to talk a little bit later, even though I don't have an especially good slide of it, but show you a little bit about the blood supply, all right? Because, of course, we've said the mesentery is not only keeping the gut from undergoing any kind of torsion or tangling, right? But it's also doing what? It's providing a, a, a framework for the, for the blood vascular system coming from the descending aorta to supply all the components of the small intestine, all right? And we'll take a look at that. I'll make a sketch on the board. All right, so when we start looking at the histology, it's really, it's really kind of one of those neat structure function um, combinations here where what's our function? We want to mix it up, digest it chemically, and then absorb it. And so what do we see? We see these circular folds, the plica circularis, all right? And uh, I like the way your book calls them speed bumps, all right, as in... They are ridges on the inside of that uh, small intestine, which if you think about then the segmenta segmentation, the movement back and forth, it's as that liquid moves over those little ridges, it's getting mixed, all right? And so it facilitates that. It also increases the functional surface area of the small intestine by three times, all right? So we've gone from a six meter tube, essentially to an eight meter tube, all right? I'll qualify that by, again, reminding you of something in your book, which is the six meters is the intestine from a cadaver. And, and that means that it's, it's lost a lot of its water. And, uh, and so it's probably longer in the cadaver than it is in life. Right? But it's real hard to measure the, uh, the small intestine in life because it's held by that mesentery. And so it's kind of inconvenient to try to to measure that long coil, all right? So, but anyway, we'll stick with six meters just for the, for, for the sake of having something to, a number, okay? Now, covering the surface of those folds, of that long cylindrical tube, all right, are going to be villi, all right? Finger-like projections, all right, which you could see with your naked eye if you got real close to the surface of the gut. Better if you had a little 10 power magnifying glass. You don't need a microscope, all right, but you can see the villi, and it's just, it's shag carpeting, all right, from the 70s, okay, and, um, and that, the villi are little finger-like projections covered with an epithelium, so keep your scale correct here, all right, so here you see a single villus, all right, so these are the folds, and these folds are covered with villi, and here's a villus here, all right, and you can see that the villi themselves, these finger-like projections, which again add to the functional surface area, increasing it by tenfold, all right, so now we've got a 30 times increase in surface area when we combine the folds and the villi. And each of these is covered with an epithelium, right? And what's our epithelium in the intestine? It is a simple columnar, all right? And if you were to look closely at the cells, you'd see that the cells, simple columnar, but they have what? What are these called? Microvilli. Can you see these in the microscope? No, you can see evidence of them as they form a little bright line along the, along the luminal surface of the cells, but you can't see these 
The only way you can see them is if you, um, yeah, if you um, use an electron microscope, which is what this image is here. All right. So this is an electron micrograph, and here you can see the microvilli. So we had folds, we had villi, and now we have microvilli. All right. And those increasing our functional surface area 20-fold. All right. So do the math. All right. What do we say? 3 times 10 is 30 times 20, 600 times. All right. Pretty impressive. All right. To increase the functional surface area 600 times. All right. Um, in between the villi, again, we're down at that 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 um, level where a low power microscope might be handy. All right. Low power microscope where you're able to look in here. You've got these these crypts, all right, these intestinal crypts, or as so many things in the body are named after somebody, these are sometimes called the crypts of Lieberkins, right, Lieberkins. And, um, and it is within these crypts that you're going to find um, some of the secretory cells that are adding to the, uh, um, to, the, to the digestive juices, mostly adding, as you can see here, hormones, all right. So gastrin and cholecystokinin and gastric inhibitory protein. All right, these are these are hormones. So what kind of cells are we going to find within these crypts? Enteroendocrine, right? Enteroendocrine. We saw some of those in the stomach releasing gastrin. Now we see them in the crypts producing several other hormones. And all of these hormones, as you might guess, without us going into that physiology, are doing what? They're regulating the whole process, okay? And just to, without, again, putting a, a label on each hormone, for right now it's not, not needed, but you think about gastrin, it's affecting the stomach, gastric motility, how, how much churning is going on there, all right? And how much acid and enzymes are being produced there, all right? And secretin and cholecystokinin, what are some of the other things? Coordinating the secretions of the pancreas, coordinating the release of bile from the gallbladder, all right? And of course, motility, all right, within the, within the small intestine, all right? So you have hormonal control here. Um, well, while we're thinking about it, as we, before we leave this, all right, you've got these other two layers here, right? Down here, you've got your muscularis externa, intercircular outer longitudinal, yes, and Hormones are acting to affect their action, all right? But they also have automaticity, right? They also have intrinsic contractile activity, right? Hence, if you're fasting, do you still eliminate waste, solid waste? Yes, you do, all right? Because your, your gut, even though the hormones aren't being released because there's nothing triggering the release of hormones, all right? to mediate some of these actions, you still have that automaticity or that intrinsic contractile activity that is a characteristic of smooth muscle, all right, a characteristic of smooth muscle cells. What else do we find down in the intestinal crypts? We're going to find mucus producing cells and very importantly, we're going to find the progenitors of the columnar epithelium, all right, of that simple columnar epithelium. And so what's happening then is you have cells dividing down in the crypts, all right, and being pushed up, 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 up to the tip of the villi where they are shed, all right. And I've told you this before, those cells, that whole surface then is renewed about every three days, all right, which is impressive, all right. You think about renewing cells. You're, you're replacing the lining of your gut every three days. What does that tell you about those cells in your gut? There's a lot of heavy lifting going on there. There's a lot of abuse going on there that you're having to renew that, that epithelium at, at such a frequent uh, rate. Okay. Now, when we look at the villus, I want to say a word about the, uh, the blood vascular components here. And within the villus, you have a little capillary that runs up in the villus and comes back, all right, draining the villus. And that little uh, capillary is carrying most of the absorbed nutrients. That is, it's carrying the breakdown products of carbohydrates, the sugars, 
It's carrying the break breakdown products of proteins, the amino acids, all right? It's carrying other things that are water soluble as long as the molecules aren't too big. If they're big molecules like vitamins can be, or if they're lipid soluble, they're not absorbed into the blood system, all right, into the blood vascular system here. Instead, they're absorbed into a little central lymphatic capillary, all right? Who doesn't understand the lymphatic system? Be honest. You don't have a clue what I'm talking about when I talk about lymphatics. Good. You got it? Really? All right, so when I say that the lymphatic system is a one-way drainage system, does that make sense? Or should I make a sketch? All right, now you're talking. All right, so real quick, okay, when we talk about the lymphatic system, because we'll come back to it later, all right, when you think about your circulatory system, you have what? You have arteries, right? All right, arteries branching out, right? Eventually giving rise to capillaries, right? And then these eventually converging to form what? To form veins. I told you it was just going to be a sketch. It's not a work of art. Okay, so this is the way your blood vascular system is set up. It's a round trip, isn't it? Arteries go to capillaries, go to veins. I'm not paying attention to whether this is into the pulmonary system or the systemic. It doesn't matter. Arteries become capillary or become arterioles, become capillaries, become venules, become veins. It's a round trip. It's a circuit, right? The lymphatic system isn't like that. The lymphatic system is a collection system for anything that leaks out of the capillaries, which is a lot of liquid, actually, all right? You lose about 30 liters of fluid out of your blood vascular system all right, a day, all right? Most of that is reabsorbed back into the capillaries, but about three liters of that each day is left out in the tissues, all right? Three liters doesn't sound like as much when I just used the word, you talked about 30 liters a second ago, but three liters is still significant, right? Think about, you know, when you have edema for one reason or another, you've been on an airplane all day or something, or, you know, or older people at least, right? You think about three liters of edema. So you have this system here that, ha that begins with small little lymphatic capillaries and eventually it drains back into the blood vascular system as the veins near the heart, okay? And this, so it's a collection system for anything that leaked out and wasn't re-collected um, back into the blood vascular system. Your lymphatic system picks up the excess, okay? Well, when we think about then the villi, all right, here's our villus, and we have then a little capillary network here, all right, that's absorbing most everything, all right, but we also have a lymphatic vessel, and that lymphatic vessel will join others. And what I want you to see here this is, this is, can you think of these as little finger-like blind-ended capillaries that are reaching in to the tissues and collecting anything that's left and then draining in? You got that? That's what's happening here. And this is called a central lacteal. And the word lacteal sounds like it's associated with what? Anytime you see that first LAC, lac means milk, right? And, and it is called the central lacteal because when it absorbs fats, it takes on a cloudy appearance. It looks milky, all right? And that's what its job is. Its job is to absorb fat, all right? Dietary fat. So when there's fat out here in the gut, all right, that fat is broken down, all right, into smaller molecules. Those molecules are transferred across the epithelium and they are delivered into the lymphatic system and they will eventually drain into the heart or into the uh, blood vascular system and, and be in your blood, all right? But, but they begin, okay, uh, by entering in through the, through the lymphatic system. Okay.